Barbara Peters. Welcome to another episode of the Criminal Calendar. This is an historic first for us because this is the first time we have actually re-interviewed an author. <laughs> Hi, Laurie King. Hi. And it's because she's so dazzling and her work is so <laughs> prolific. We just didn't cover it last time, did we? <laughs> Only an hour. Well, you know, when was it? We talked the first time. It was, I think, maybe like book three of Mary Russell? It was a while back, yeah. Might have yeah. been when you published Letter of Mary. Something like that, yeah. And lots of good things have happened since. Laurie um, is now on the New York Times bestseller list, which is, is this the first time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, another best bestseller list, but not the Times. And the title of the book um, that has brought her to this acclaim is, in fact, right here. It's called Justice Hall in the Middle, which we'll be talking about. But you were, you and I were just together uh, a couple weeks ago in Portland, Oregon, where you were the guest of honor at Left Coast Crime. Left Coast Crime, right. Tell us about Left Coast Crime. It's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Left Coast for a reason. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. we're definitely Left Coast. And I, being a Left Coast native, um, uh, feel right at home. Um, right there south of Santa Cruz yeah, is where you're from. Yeah, we hide in the mountains. Um, it's nice because it's a lot smaller than some of the enormous conferences like VoucherCon, um, which you really can get lost in. But this one had something like 700 people. That's a good number. It's, yeah. It was quite a few. And um, writers and editors, but a lot of fans. And it was, it was fun. I enjoyed it. So as guest of honor, how is it different from just showing up and, you know, being an <laughs> author? I mean, do you just get more air time? <laughs> well, you can't go down for breakfast without combing your hair first because people notice. <laughs> Did they trap you in the washroom? Um, I, I mostly went back to my room to use the, the John, I have to admit. Um, no, it was, it was great. The people, I have heard stories in the past of you know, people sliding their manuscript under the stall doors and asking for autographs while you're washing your hands in the sink. But I found them very polite and, and gentle people and very enthusiastic. So That's wonderful. I actually have heard of a conference where they put up signs on the outside of the restroom saying autograph-free zone yeah, so the author yeah. had a sporting chance to go in there and right. clean up. Yeah. No, I, I've heard of those too. But no, I found it, I found it really nice. Um, and it's interesting to be able to carry on a dialogue in effect with fans because it was over a three-day period mm -hmm. and I was on a couple panels and then had a talk with Steve Saylor who was the other guest of honor and uh, so people got a chance to see about as much of me as they really needed to see. <laughs> I never tire of you. I went to several <laughs> oh, of your you panels. Dear. Thank you, dear. It was a lot of fun and, and interestingly enough your work falls into several um, what do I want to say? I don't like the words genre, niche, and all that stuff. But because your books, right, have their historical, some of them, some mm -hmm. of them are contemporary. You've got a series uh, with Kate Martinelli, which is contemporary San Francisco. She's a lesbian. She's a policewoman. So you got a whole bunch of stuff to say there. Your Mary Russell series is um, back turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to, to say turn of the 20th century. Just say 20s. It's okay. Okay, we could do that. But I mean, I realized the other day that when you say turn of the century now, it has a whole new meaning. I'm afraid so. Yeah, I keep referring to this century, meaning the 20th. <laughs> right. Well, there you are. But anyway, and, and so those books, um, you know, she's um, American. She's half Jewish, isn't it? Or is she fully? She's Jewish and half American. Oh, well, okay. Um, and she's, she is at a young age married to an elderly Sherlock Holmes, so you've got all that going on. And then because you yourself are a student of religion, um, in fact, you are a doctor if I'm of, I never get this quite right. Well, Tell I'm me a, again. I'm a fake doctor. You uh, mean as an honorary degree? Uh, it's an honorary doctorate. Nonetheless, what uh, is nonetheless. the full title? Um, I, I think they just call it an honor, a doctorate of, an honorary doctor of letters or, I, I, no, know. but I don't know in, what the letters is it are. religious studies? Um, my, my degree is in theology, so this would be in theology, yeah. Old Testament is my field, so. Right. But, so you've got a lot of that informing particularly your Mary Russell books. Letter of Mary, for example, mm -hmm. is just a marvelous book where you put, you're the only person I know who could actually make a thriller out of your subject matter. I just found it fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> you did that particularly in another book I brought along, um, A Darker Place. Yeah. That one, um, that one has a lot of religious elements in, in the sense that it's modern religious movements. Um, 
the character who goes and, and investigates so-called cults, which isn't really my field. I mean, if you're looking at what my academic background is, I'm, I'm much more ethereal and Old Testament, you know, Hebrew and a bit of Greek and that sort of thing. But I was very interested in this, how does a religion come out of being a sect or cult and become an established religion? I mean, if you read the newspapers and see a small group, um, they're always referred to as a cult because they're new and they're small. Um, you know, when Arthur Conan Doyle was writing his Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, the Mormon religion was a cult because it oh, was right. small and it was out there and far away. And so he has this whole story that he develops about, you know, the, the wicked Mormons. Well, a hundred years later, they're a religious tradition. And that process by which a group moves from being very out there and questionable to being mainstream and accepted is, to me, very interesting. It was an interesting character, too. I'm sorry I blanked out on her name. That one is Anne, Anne Waverly. Right, and she she actually goes undercover yeah. within a cult. She has been involved in religious groups herself and is a professor of modern religious movements, um, which is a proper name for cults, modern religious movements. Okay. And, uh, and so she goes and investigates for the FBI in this book. Um, but this isn't the first time either, right? Yeah, she's, she's yeah there's done what, this four before? or something? I think, I think four so. earlier ones. I, I can't remember. But right. <laughs> So she's kind it's of been a, a freelancer. Since I read it. Well, me too, which is why I couldn't remember her name. But she kind of, she's kind of a freelancer for the FBI, and she goes under. You know, it's interesting. I was just thinking when you were saying that. Does cult have a pejorative meaning? Do you think? I mean, it sounds as though, to my ear today, that it does. You know, there's like many words. Um, there is a technical use of the word cult, which most of these religious traditions are not. Most of them are sects because they're a group of a mainstream religion, but. It, no one in the modern news services or media ever uses the word cult in that sense. They always use it in a pejorative sense. It's always used as a value judgment, not as a description. Right, and it has a lot of baggage with it normally. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it almost always implies people who are either been coerced or deluded. Yeah. You always have Jonestown and the rest of it dragged in with the every time you use the word cult, which is why Anne Waverly doesn't tend to use the word cult very often. Right. Actually, sect, you're right, is correct. I mean, that would be the one that would just say it's a splinter group yeah. of whatever other, sure. um, with its own orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. There's um, a wonderful book, and I, this is my day not to remember anything. Permanent Press is publishing, I think it's called A Wicked Act. I think that is the title, A Wicked Act. It's going to be published in June. And it is set back in Puritan America, and particularly when the Quakers um, were, in fact, mm -hmm. considered by the Puritans to be a cult yeah. in the pejorative sense. Oh, yeah. And it was just a terrible time. And, and there was a lot of violence and damage done, and people died and so forth. And it was interesting. They, uh, they brought the book, or the packaging that comes with the book, you know, those letters that tell you how you should read the book, mm -hmm. uh, which usually I throw away, but I happen to read this one. And it pointed out that right now with the Taliban and al-Qaeda and, you know, a lot of things going on in Islam, um, that this was a particularly interesting book to remind us mm -hmm. about not only our American roots, but how the Christian religion has on yeah. many occasions been like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, that's one of, the, one of the reasons that I write fiction is because you can explore ideas like that, allow people to hear the overtones if they want to, um, so long as they don't get in the way of telling the story. And, um, you know, people are always saying that they learn something from your book. Or, and quite often what they mean is that they learn facts about a certain historical period, which is always a little shaky because, <laughs> you know, we tell lies for a living. So I wouldn't really write, you know, write the history books based on what they're finding in, in novels like these. 